Good evening. What a friendly, nice crowd. And i um, really glad to see each and every one of you. And very glad um, that um, Dr. Edgar Manson has come home. <laughs> At least for a few days. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce her. Um, Dr. Manson is professor of the London, with the London and Windsor Community Chair in Islamic Studies at Huron University College, University of Western Ontario, London, Canada. Yeah. And um, as you know, um, Dr. Matson Ingrid was at Hartford Seminary for a good long time, um, and um, she graduated from the University of Chicago uh, with her PhD and um, is, was the founder of the, uh, the, the Muslim Chaplaincy Program, so the first really Muslim Chaplaincy Program in the country. Um, and um, was um, also the director of the McDonald Center. So Ingrid um, has held many, uh, many uh, positions here um, and um, has contributed uh, mightily to the seminary and to the larger Muslim community um, in Connecticut and abroad and all over the United States. As you know, Ingrid's the past president of the Islamic Society of North America. And I'm sure in Canada they're very happy to have her contributing in her wonderful, wise, and, um, and gentle way um, to uh, life um, in the Muslim community and with, with friends in the Muslim community um, all over Canada as well. And of course, Ingrid continues to, to work and do a lot of things um, here in the United States as well. So um, I think that's all I'll say. I suppose there's one more thing to say. Um, Ingrid has, um, has published a book, which is one of the prettiest books. It's my favorite cover. Um, and it's the story of the Quran. It's history and place in Muslim life. And if you haven't read that book, um, please do. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and you will uh, enjoy a lot and learn from it. So Ingrid, please come here. Um, and greet your friends and colleagues, as well as some others that you may or may not know. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of God, the merciful, and the compassionate. Well, I'm so happy to be back to one of my homes. Um, I'm very blessed to be able to have a number of homes across this world, and this is certainly one of them. I want to thank Heidi Hadzel, President Hadzel, for asking me to come to speak to you today, and I want to thank Dean Uriah Kim for inviting me back to teach this week, to teach my uh, Maid Servants of Allah Spirituality and Muslim Women class. Uh, I'm so delighted to see that Hartford Seminary contributed continues to attract such wonderful students, smart, creative, engaged. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, so I'm going to have to come back another time. <laughs> and a broader thanks to all of those who have been involved in governing the school, Harvard Seminary, to those who teach here and who have shaped its programs over the year. Although I had long been an adult, when I first arrived to teach at Harvard Seminary, I believe it is here where I have truly matured intellectually. Beyond that, this was the place where I could find advice and friendship during the challenging first decade of the third millennium. It's another way of, I know, after 9-11. <laughs> during the last year I lived in Connecticut, we had a significant natural disaster. The October snowstorm that brought down trees and power lines all across the state. My family had significant but not tragic damage. The biggest challenge was not knowing how long we would be without power. It turned out to be nine days. We could not leave the house because my daughter was bedridden and needed a special air cooling system. Fortunately, we had purchased a gas generator in case of such a necessity. But my husband was out of state for work, so my son and I took turns filling up that generator every five hours. We could not have left our house even to get gas for that generator if it had not been for our neighbors. Our car was blocked in by a driveway filled with fallen trees and branches. It was our neighbors, some who we knew well and others who we knew only in passing, 
who came and sawed up that wood and stacked it and cleared the driveway. Others in Connecticut were, of course, more desperate and in need of assistance more than we were. Many people would not have survived the disaster without help from their neighbors. One thing we know about disasters is that they are inescapably about place. In an age of virtual reality where we can escape to other countries and imaginary worlds, disasters rudely force us back into our bodies. Water creeps upstairs, flooding the attic where an elderly woman has taken refuge from a storm. The limb of an old oak laden with snow crashes into the home of a disabled man taking down power lines and blocking the door. A criminal draws a gun in a convenience store, trapping half a dozen people, carrying shopping baskets with heads of lettuce and sliced bread. A bomb explodes at a sporting event, and a man looks down to see that his shirt is on fire and his foot is missing. In disasters, where we are and who is with us are the most important factors determining our survival. Disasters are all about place, and in those places, it is only those who are physically near who can save us. A sense of community emerges almost immediately in the wake of a disaster. One minute, we are strangers, avoiding eye contact as we ride the bus or subway to work. The next minute, we are clutching hands in the dark, weaving through broken glass and twisted metal. Soon enough, police and ambulances will arrive if government services are well developed and efficient. Where that is not the case, first CNN, then perhaps the Red Cross and other international aid agencies will arrive to help for a few weeks or months, or if you are lucky, maybe a few years. But at the beginning of a disaster and at the end of it, it is the people standing beside you and the people living around you who would determine first your survival and next your safety. Necessity always permits exceptional behavior. And unfortunately, the sense of solidarity generated by a disaster can be ephemeral. More than that, without a disaster, many things can block the establishment of good neighborly ties political and religious chauvinism, ethnic bigotry, cultural miscommunication, all these can create walls between the neighbors. I first saw this negative dynamic where I grew up in a small Canadian city known for meatpacking and rubber factories. There were so few black people in my community that they remained individual anomalies, not a racial community. We, the majority, a mix of Canadians of German, Irish, and English descent, assumed an implicit solidarity in being white, I suppose, only in opposition to the recent Portuguese immigrants. Vulgar boys called them guidos and laughed at their shiny black dress shoes. Fastidious housefrauens spoke disapprovingly of the way they turned their front lawns into vegetable gardens or shrines to Our Lady of Fatima. Surely Plato would have upheld our assertions that vegetable gardens belong in the backyard. But their children were pretty much like us, and by the time we were teenagers, we were all embarrassed by our parents, so it didn't matter much anymore. Alas, the problem of bigotry and alienation from people construed other than us does not end with a reconciliation among neighbors. All too often, our hard-won unity is solidified at the expense of others and justified through values such as national interest. National identity and citizenship is like an exclusive club. If you get in, you have all the privileges. If not, then our collective interests surpass your rights, even your basic rights, to control and benefit from your natural resources and lands. Cosmopolitanism, a philosophy of social ethics,
attempts to find ways to bridge the divide we make between us and others, to try to find ways to erase the preference we give to those familiar over those who are strangers. Some suggest that only deliberate estrangement from your own people is sufficient to break such group prejudice. Others might consider such estrangement extreme if it is permanent, but that it could be an ethical action if taken to the, group, to the degree necessary to break the pattern of granting those close to you rights and concern and compassion above those who are distant. Of course, there are many people in the world who do not have the choice but to be estranged from their people and their native lands. They are forced into displacement by economic, ecological, and political upheaval. They feel disconnected to people and lost in the land where they now find themselves. The question we need to ask ourselves is, if we can turn this estrangement, this feeling of disconnection, into a positive, an opportunity for positive spiritual growth. When the Prophet Muhammad and his followers had to flee Mecca because of oppression, they settled in a land that was culturally and ecologically different. Many of the Prophet's companions fell ill in Medina. One of them, Bilal, <coughs> Incapacitated by fever, recited some lines of poetry. Would that I could stay overnight in a valley wherein I would be surrounded by the sweet-smelling grasses I know. Would that one day I drink the water of Majana, and would that the two mountains of Shana and Tafil appear to me. Bilal missed his homeland, the taste of its water, its smells, the contours of its landscape. How many today share this sense of longing? But to flee oppression is a requirement if we have the opportunity to do so. They fled from Mecca to Medina to a foreign land for the sake of living an ethical life, a life where they could live in accordance with the law and not have to distort their behavior in order to survive in an unlawful and unholy place. The Quran says, when angels take the souls of those who die in sin or who die in a state of hurting their own selves, the angels will say, What's your story? What was your situation? And they reply, we were weak and oppressed on the earth. The angels will say, was not God's earth spacious enough for you to move yourselves away from evil? So there is an ethical obligation to try to find that place, to find that place where we can live as full human beings, as human beings of integrity and ethics. And this is certainly why many people come to this country, why many people come to Canada and other countries that are governed by the rule of law. And that is, of course, why we emphasize the need for us and them to understand the value and the significance of this system that ensures the rule of law. And it is certainly why I believe, as a Muslim, that it is absolutely our obligation to reiterate and emphasize the value of this system and the need to support and defend the system. That the system of law, the rule of law that protects people and ensures their religious freedom and their ability to live in a way that is true to their values and beliefs is absolutely critical. If we are to identify the nation, the modern nation state, if there is something good in the modern nation state, it is this ability 
to establish itself through a rule of law. That there are many other levels or perspectives from which we can analyze the nation and our community. And of course, the problem, as I implied earlier, is when we consider our nation to be superior in and of itself, and our, the people of our nation to be demanding and deserving more of having their rights, and not just their rights, but their needs and even their wishes fulfilled at the expense of others. This is the estrangement. This is where estrangement is needed. Estrangement from the interests of the group. Of the, group. the group sentiment is something that the great uh, Arab Muslim philosopher Ibn Khaldun talked about. The fact that this zeal for the group, which he called Asabiya, is so important as a source of cohesion in society. It's natural within ourselves, surely during this time of the World Cup, we must understand that. But when in the World Cup we're playing on a field where the rules are equal, and the rules are applied equally to all, the goal then is to have a field where all of us as nations, as people, if this is how we are going to be formed politically, apply the same rules to us as to them, wherever they and we are. When Bilal, the companion of the Prophet, missed his homeland, he was not expressing some longing for the oppression of Mecca, he was simply recognizing and expressing a very natural human connection to the land that is familiar to us. There is a question of whether any particular land is more holy or more sacred or more special than another land. The Quran answers this, I think, for Muslims saying, uh, allowing us to spread out across the earth, to seek our livelihood, in fact, commanding us to do that. And the Prophet Muhammad said, the earth has been made wholesome for me. And the earth itself, the dirt, the soil is a means of purification. If you don't have water, you can purify yourself with clean soil. And the earth has been made a mosque for us, a place of prayer. So wherever a person may be when the time for prayer comes, let him or her pray wherever he or she finds themselves. Our acts of worship do ground us anywhere we move, any place where we go in the world, first we have to figure out where we are on this earth in order to know how to pray. We have to find that direction of the Qibla, the direction of the prayer. We need to figure out the course of the sun to know the times for prayers. This should bring us in contact with the land and our evolution in contact with the water. The relationship between nature and culture and making us feel grounded and making us feel of a place is complex. When I was a child, I would roam the woods with my siblings and cousins. We were fortunate to have land shared by our large extended family for generations with summer homes strung along the shoreline. The property was a heavily wooded headland on an island, surrounded on three sides by the St. Lawrence River. <clears throat> now this was an age before seatbelts and bicycle helmets and parents accompanying their children to the playground. 
There were always enough siblings or neighbor kids or cousins around to form a collectivity that gave us sufficient measure of safety. There was a kind of instinctive huddling together that kids had, like those schools of fish you see on the Discovery Channel. I remember one of the many days we had decided to set out for an adventure, this time to head to the big marsh to look for turtles. My mother wasn't sure we should go that far, but my father said, remember, you are never lost. Just keep going, and you'll eventually arrive either at a road or at the shore. And then you can follow that home until it takes you someplace familiar. You can follow it until it takes you someplace familiar, and then you can find your way home from there. Now, I know this is probably not good advice for every environment. I've seen enough wilderness survivor shows to know that foraging straight ahead in a Brazilian rainforest or an Arctic tundra, for example, is not necessarily a successful strategy for keeping alive. But it was the right advice for this particular stretch of land upon which we wandered and where my father and his siblings and cousins had explored before us. And beneath my father's instructions was the wisdom that there are two kinds of things we can always find to guide us on this earth. Human-made things like a road, and natural-made things like a shoreline. That is, the paths that other people have made before us, and the paths that God has set in nature. Cultural and natural signs for the journey. We live in a time of great displacement and transition. Many feel lost and out of place. To feel like we belong in a place, in the place where we live, we need to be connected to both the nature and the culture of that place. Otherwise, even if we are accompanied by some brothers and sisters, we will feel lost. We need those who have been there before us to orient us. But we need to set out and seek this learning and orientation. In Canada, it was the Aboriginal people who did this for the early English and French explorers, helping them navigate the inland waters that is, to see the natural signs, as well as showing them cultural practices like canoe building that would carry them through the land to the places they needed to go. The Quran links the ability of humans to move through the earth as indicative of their dignity. The Quran says, we have conferred dignity on the children of Adam and borne them over land and sea and provided for them sustenance out of the good things of life, and thus favored them far above most of our creation. So well, we who are in transition, who feel displaced, who are on the move, are working to build our relationships of culture, figuring out how we live together our shared values. We can feel more at home on this earth by connecting with the land and with the other beings created by God who live there. While we are figuring out the cultures of the people, we can have an easier time sometimes with the non-human beings. And this is part of feeling at home in the world as well, is knowing and understanding our place in the community of all living things. We live in circles of community, religious, familial, national, and also the community of living beings, human and non-human. The Quran talks about other creatures as having their own communities that intersect with ours. Quran says, don't you see that it is God whose praises all beings in the heavens and earth celebrate, as well as the birds with wings outspread. Each one knows its own prayer and praise. 
Even if you are praying alone in the woods, or you think you are alone, you are surrounded by other beings that are in a state of prayer and praise. The Quran says there is not an animal on the earth nor a flying creature on two wings, but they are communities. The word here used is ummah, which we often think as somehow special to the Muslim religious community. But they too are in communities like yours. So even if we don't know many people, we shouldn't feel alone because they are all around us. Indeed, even the little ants that invade our kitchens this time of year. But we have to remember the chapter of the Quran that's named after the ant. And what a striking shift of perspective God gives us in this passage of the Quran because the ant is mentioned in the context of the description of the majestic and great army of Solomon. And he marshals his troops and he begins marching out on the earth. And we have that perspective of the human ability to be dominant and powerful. And suddenly, the little voice of the end comes and says, hey, Solomon, Solomon is up there, all you other ants, run into your home so you don't get trampled on. God lets us hear what the ants are saying to remind us that there are others on this earth who share this space and who have a right to have their communities exist undisturbed. Solomon is given the gift of the ability to understand the ant and reassures her that he will not trample upon her home. So they are there all around us. And it can make us feel a sense of comfort and community, even during the time when it seems a little bit difficult to figure out the people around us. How do we feel that we know where we are, that we have knowledge? God, in the Holy Quran, describes the creation of humanity. And it is by the act of teaching Adam the names of all things that Adam become, acquires, and assumes this position on the earth of being in charge as the steward of the earth and, and knowing himself and his place in creation. What does it mean to come to a place and be taught those names? It is this mountain, this is Avon Mountain, this is the Farmington River, this is a cardinal, this is a red-tailed hawk. All of these things help us feel empowered because we know the context in which we are. We know how to call things. We know who is around us and what is around us. I went last summer to uh, to New Zealand to visit my best friend and celebrate my 50th birthday with her. And there was something there, a program there that amazed me. I think of it all the time. New Zealand has been very generous in welcoming you know, a significant number of war refugees to its country. Now New Zealand is pretty much the farthest place on earth. <laughs> that many people could go to, maybe. Certainly if you're coming from Somalia, it's pretty different. And I met a community of Somalians in the middle of New Zealand. They had come from war, they had come from a society that was in great upheaval, and they'd come to a place where there were lovely, welcoming people, but these people didn't look very much like them at all. Probably about as different among human beings as you could get. Their customs, their habits, 
their way of reading, their expectations for many things about the way that people would live in society, how they would socialize, were very different. They felt awkward. They felt foreign. They felt alien. And in this context, there was a brilliant woman, she happened to be American, who had moved there and saw, especially with the teenage girls, the young girls, how difficult it was for them. They felt so awkward. They wore their scarves and their cloaks and walked through. Their parents were so afraid to let them go anywhere. It seemed like such an unfamiliar and unsafe place. So this woman decided to get these girls connected with the land in which they lived. They weren't going to go to the clubs with the other teenagers. They weren't going to go to the dances and the parties. So all they could feel there was that they didn't belong. They didn't have something to do in this place. So she designed a program, an outdoor leadership program. Three years these girls were in this program. They learned to kayak and set up a tent and start a fire and repel and mountain climb and fish and many more things. When I met these girls, it was immediately evident in how they stood the success that this program had created. And I'd seen many other refugee communities in the country before then. These girls, even though they stood about a foot shorter than me, so they were even short for me, they were standing strong, tall, shoulders back. They had a posture that said they owned the space that they were in. And they said to me when I got there, they said, oh, do you like the outdoors? Do you like hiking? I said, I love hiking. They said, then you have to go to this mountain and take this path because it is so beautiful. Will you have time to go to the river? Our favorite place in the river is this. And they described to me their whole landscape and what I would see there. And it was such a powerful example of how beginning with a connection to the land could create the sense of safety, of confidence, and from that, they, it built a sense of confidence that allowed them to engage with others and it also built a common love for the land with the other people. And it is something that the people of New Zealand is very important to them. And so now they had a deep, embodied sense of belonging and commonality with their neighbors. Now, if we return, however, to the issue of creating a unity among the differences that we have, whether it is between neighbors as after living you know, for many years in my neighborhood in West Hartford and developed ties and feelings of commonality and unity with my neighbors, or this Somalian refugee community in New Zealand and their sense of becoming grounded and having something to share. How do we then, after becoming grounded and, and part grounded in the land and part of society, not simply fall into the old pattern of preferring what keeps us comfortable over the rights of others. And one of the major problems for us, of course, is that the land that we come into is not always uncontested. When I returned to Canada after living abroad for abroad in the United States here for so long, <laughs> I uh, my return coincided with a remarkable um, 
movement of activism among Aboriginal people in Canada. Uh, and this movement had decided that the time had come for the government to finally honor its treaty obligations. Canada still has outstanding over 600 treaties with First Nations people that are either unfulfilled or whose terms have been broken. And it's become particularly urgent now at a time of massive oil uh, and natural resource extraction when uh, the government and corporations are leveraging the undecided or indeterminate status of these treaties to push through uh, these projects. When I returned to Canada and, and learned about what was happening, at the same time, there was a uh, one of the chiefs, Chief Teresa Spence, from one of the northern communities who had petitioned the government again and again and again and again to come and do something uh, to resolve these issues. When the government refused to listen, she decided to camp out on a small island in the Ottawa River that is right at the cliff uh, uh, where the Parliament, um, the Parliament of Canada stands in Ottawa. So you could be on this little island and look right up at the Parliament buildings. The island is unceded territory. So she was able to camp on this. So Chief, Chief, Chief Teresa Spence camped there for a number of months and people came to visit her, those to express support. And I really felt called to go do this. Um, to de demonstrate solidarity with this movement. Uh, when I was on my way, this is a quick, short drive in the weekend in February, I remembered that a Hartford Seminary alum, Sandy Mutawali, was now the imam of the main mosque in Ottawa. And Sandy, for those of you who didn't know him, was educated in Al-Azhar in Cairo, came to Hartford Seminary in a Fulbright uh, and then became so enamored and, and just enthusiastic about Christian Muslim relations and interfaith relations that he stayed and studied here and uh, uh, and when I was asked for recommendations about an imam for a number of places I gave Sandy's name and he eventually uh, established himself in Ottawa. So I gave Sandy a call and I said, um, Look, I'm on the road, I'm going to come to Ottawa, I'd really like to see your, uh, visit you for a few minutes and see your new setting. So, of course, by, by the time I got there, Sammy had gathered a few hundred people <laughs> in the mosque <laughs> and said, uh, you, have to, you have to give us a lecture, you have to tell us what you're doing. And so I talked about it, and I talked about the importance of Muslims understanding this context, particularly in the context of honoring treaties and covenants. The Quran says, Be not like the one who breaks and untwists the yarn which she has spun by using your oaths as a mean of deceiving one another, simply because some of you may be more powerful than others. The Quran says that a breaking of an oath, and all of these treaties were made as a, as a, as a solemn oath, that the parties would uphold the sides. The breaking of an oath must be atoned for by feeding 10 needy persons with the same food as you yourself would consume, or by giving the same clothing, or by freeing a human being from bondage. The Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, whoever takes a false oath to deprive someone of his property will find God angry with him when he meets God on the Day of Judgment. It is these very stern commands that made me afraid in front of God of what this meant to be on the side of the treaty uh, breakers. When I uh, finished my lecture and I said to Imam Sami that I was now heading down to the site, he said, why am I going to come with you? <laughs> so he had his white light uh, imam thobe on uh, and uh, threw in a jacket, completely inappropriately dressed for February in uh, Ottawa, Canada, with lots of snow, and it was a cold snap. He 
even for us. But he was enthusiastic, so he and a few of the members of the Board of Trustees came with us, and we went down to the camp, where Sam was very enthusiastic, and he was talking to everyone and trying to understand. And I was uh, listening to him have a conversation with one of the uh, uh, men from uh, Chief Teresa Spence's tribe, who said to him, look, it's like this. Either you are a First Nation, a member of a First Nation, or you're a settler. And the look of confusion and realization on the face of someone who just immigrated to Canada a year ago was interesting to see. Here he had set up this dichotomy, I think, I mean most immigrants set up a dichotomy in their mind that they are immigrants or new Canadians or new Americans and vis-a-vis -vis the old Canadians or the ones who are already there. So he considered himself to be on the side of minority he was a minority who was trying to find his way and to ensure his rights and his survival there. Now he was being told, no, you're a settler, you're part of the majority, and you're part of the group that has been denying us, or you're at least benefiting from what the group was denying us our rights. This was a, this is a beautiful moment, I believe, to create that kind of alienation and displacement. Because now, any of us who are in this position would see that we are never simply the disempowered, or we are never simply the minority. That we are also, at the same time, simultaneously, almost all of us, in a position of empowerment, and in a position where we are um, continuing a system that denies others their rights. And of course, he was wonderful. And you know, a few days later, he went and brought his his whole family, all his kids, his wife down to meet everyone there, and, and continued with this education. So it was a wonderful, you know, example of you know, obviously he's a smart and ethical person who would continue this. But this is something that is uh, a major issue in the world today. This is not just an, an issue just for Canadians, but every place in the world where indigenous people have had their lands taken from them in the past by colonial powers or settlers. This has, and this has occurred from the most northern regions of North America to the southern tip of South America, as well as Australia and New Zealand. But we can't just make this a white or European problem. Because, as this man had pointed out to Imam Sami, those of us who come from other places become part of the empowered class. And the group that continues to perpetuate a system where these rights, the group rights, the historical rights, continue to be denied. The seizing of land for the sake of establishing a new colonial settlement or nation is generally not possible in the 21st century. 21st century. Tragically, so-called ethnic cleansing within nations is still alive and well, with the result that some groups seize and occupy the lands of a dehumanized and stigmatized group. The most extreme and horrifying case at this time, perhaps, is occurring in Myanmar, Whereas we have seen recently in Nicholas Kristof's reporting and elsewhere, even Buddhist monks are justifying and encouraging the more murder of the Rohingya. The situation demands urgent attention, which it is not getting. However, that is not the focus of my talk today. Rather, I return our attention to the ethics of land use and acquisition as it relates to our ability to live ethically on this earth. There are many places in the world where land is being acquired not for the sake of settling, but in order to extract and transport natural resources found therein, such as oil, gas, and lumber, or to establish huge commercial farms for export. The sovereign wealth funds of countries such as Saudi Arabia and China, as well as a 
American, Canadian, and global corporations have, with their deep pockets, somehow convinced governments to appropriate the lands for, the pur for purposes that mostly violate the common good. And the interests of the people, be they Aboriginal or simply residents and citizens, not to mention the animals and other creatures who inhabit these lands. This is happening in Brazil, and Ecuador, Nigeria, Sudan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and beyond. This is not a European problem. It is not a white problem. It is a global problem. You know, one of the first things Muslims do when they move to a place after identifying where the Qibla is and the prayer schedule and so orienting themselves in the world is to look for so-called halal food. And what they mean by that is meat that has been slaughtered in a lawful fashion. Now, classical Islamic law books do not talk about halal meat. This is a modern turn of phrase. They simply describe the rules for the slaughter of animals for consumption. But they also describe the rules for the acquisition of land, for the use of water, for the use or acquisition of so-called uh, uh, dead land, for what kind of crops should be grown and when those crops are grown, who has a right to share in them. In the wake of colonialism, perhaps, much of Islamic law has been reduced to personal practice looking only at very narrow personal obligations, like the direct connection between the meat we eat and ourselves, and neglecting the systems in which we live. Thus, the focus on halal meat is a selective concern for a constrained set of ethical obligations. The recent broader concern for the way animals are treated in their life how they are transported, whether the workers who take care for, of those animals and slaughter the animals are being adequately paid and given the rights, their labor rights. All of, these, all of the increased interest in these issues is an appropriate recommitment to ethical responsibility. The least we can do is leverage our power as consumers to try to influence the supply chain so the question is, what makes our food and other goods halal? And what would it mean to live on halal land? What about the resources that we use? What makes them halal? Certainly goods that are taken from misappropriated land can't possibly be lawful. One of my students gave a presentation this week on Fatima al-Fihri, al -Fihriya, who is the founder of al qarabin which is the oldest continually operating university in the world. Uh, one of the things that uh, Fatima al-Fihriya inherited a great deal of wealth because many of her family members died within a short period of time she and her sister inherited this vast wealth. Fatima decided that with it, she wanted to establish a mosque and a university, and she did that in Fez. Some of you may have visited this, uh, this beautiful, incredibly blessed place in Fez, Morocco. And one of the things that she insisted on is that any of the um, any of the building materials used for this mosque university complex could only be taken from land that she owned. She didn't want one brick or one tile or one stone to be acquired unlawfully. The first thing she did before that was to dig a well, a well that all of the people of the area could benefit from. 
So we see this woman, this amazing woman, and I can't help but believe that it is because of her sincerity, because of her commitment to ethics, to, to doing this project ethically, that God has blessed this institution with such longevity. This concern to make sure that what we do is rooted in lawful land, is rooted in a blessed work. She wanted to make sure her workers also had what they needed. This is something that is a consistent theme in much Islamic spiritual literature that is has been, I would say, marginalized and neglected in much of modern Islam. I believe part of it is because of uh, a general era of hostility in many places towards classical Islamic spirituality or Sufism, both from a kind of modernist, rationalist uh, approach, but also from the, well, let's call them the right wing of our religious community, uh, who have um, oppressed and persecuted Sufis. So this idea of this kind of caution and care for each aspect of doing something, that blessing only comes by paying attention to how we do every part of something, that land, water, people, all of them must be given attention for there to be a blessing, it certainly has been ignored by these mega powers and their gigantic towers above the Gulf and elsewhere not to cast stones and glass houses. We live on this earth too in the way that we do. So what do we do? You know, it seems so overwhelming sometimes. How could we possibly pay attention to all of these things? And in conclusion, I would like to say that there are some simple concepts, ethical concepts that can help us First of all, if we want to live a so-called halal life, we could begin by lessening consumption. So that if we are mixing the unlawful with the lawful, at least it will be minimized. One of the rules in Islamic law is that, uh, you know, if you have to, by necessity, take something that's unlawful, you can only take the absolute minimum that you need to sustain your life. Lessening consumption is a general rule that is given to us by God in the Quran in any case, completely devoid of an ethical context. It is a better spiritual practice overall. The Quran says, O children of Adam, get dressed up to go to your place of prayer and eat and drink, but not in excess. Surely God does not love those who are extravagant. This verse really makes me terrified because it doesn't say God does not love extravagance. It says God does not love those who are extravagant. How terrifying to think God might withhold his love for that part of us. Although I don't think his love would ever be completely absent. Second, we cannot accomplish, we cannot possibly hope to live an ethical life by figuring all of this out ourselves. It's too much research, too much information. How could we possibly know? It is what Islamic ethics and law calls a fard kafaya, a collective obligation to establish and support government oversight and nonprofit organizations to monitor and regulate and report on these issues. And this is not a collective obligation that is religiously specific. If we possibly thought we could do this only in our own religious communities, we'd be fooling ourselves and we would be taking it seriously. We live in a global environment where these supply chains, where these contracts, where these deals, 
are being made across the world in such complicated ways. We need to understand that it is only by working with people who care, people of good values, good ethics, and good faith that we can possibly hope to avoid constantly violating the rights of others for the sake of our own enjoyment, our own needs, and our desires. Third, we have to understand that, of course, desires are not the same as needs. And while we may say, you know, we need to access that oil field, that gas field, we need these things. Needs are basic things. People need water, they need food, they need shelter. In the sign of law, there's a priority of needs. Darubiyat, Hajiyat, and Tahsiniyat. The Darubiyat, the urgent needs, are, are very basic. It is what you need to sustain life. The second level are necessities that we would consider are a part of human dignity and allow us to flourish as societies. So you can live without education, but you really can't advance very far with that. But the third level, that are sometimes called compliment, compliments or even luxuries, are things that you neither need nor are really necessary for society to advance, but all other things being equal might make your life more pleasant. Unfortunately, many of us, and I would include myself, are, will indulge in these, this third level of uh, consumption without realizing that by doing so we're impacting the ability of others to meet their urgent, life-sustaining needs. So it will take work. It takes cooperation. It takes fellowship. It takes turning away from trivial, superficial issues. It turns away from, it takes not being distracted by those who would love to have us distracted from these urgent issues by hurling insults at each other. This is the kind of place where those kind of ties and friendships and alliances can be formed. The reason why a place like Hartford Seminary is so important. Hartford Seminary among other like-minded and like-spirited places because without it, uh, although we may together find a way to live happily and as neighbors, we will also at the same time find ourselves on the side of those on the earth who are denying many others their rights. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, invite your comments. where food comes from, 
what the land practices, what the labor practices of those place, places are. There's the movement towards local consumption, you know, consumption of local progress, uh, produce. And that mostly started as a, as a health concern, but of course it has major impact on the environment as well. So it's an example of something that, um, you know, an area of our life where uh, we um, have more support and more resources readily available, especially to the ordinary consumer than in some of these other areas. Uh, and again, some people will say, well, that's fine for wealthy people. What about, you know, aren't these things expensive? Isn't it expensive to care about these things? And this is where I think, um, one, the, the issue of how much we really need to eat is one issue, you know. Um, and second, what kind of policies are in place to make some kinds of food more expensive than others? Because this isn't simply a, uh, you know, we talk about a, a, a free market, but when it comes to these things, this is not free. There are, there's, there are a lot of, inter, there are many interventions um, by uh, government and powerful agencies that uh, determine that certain kinds of foods will be, um, will be cheaper and more readily available than others. Yes, um, I was interested in your comment, or you, you use the expression, the rights of nature, the rights. And um, I've come to know that because of delegate from Bolivia, who was an indigenous person, who was a representative of this country as the United Nations, he introduced that language, and now the, the whole text of many of the documents is opening to this, the, the rights of nature, the rights that a tree has to be. And how do you define that and express that and live out of that kind of reality? And it's, it has, you know, I had people have <laughs> it has expanded people's consciousness. Only, and it came from within him. It was not anything he learned from the outside, but because it was his, his whole uh, frame of reference. And of course, when, uh, as you say, um, this, this concept, or at least this articulation of this concept, has come primarily from indigenous people in South America. And it's one of the reasons why in some of the uh, constitutions, actually, of these countries, there's a recognition not only of the right of people to have access to a wholesome ecology or, or you know, a pure and healthy ecology, but also rights of nature itself. Now, of course, with introducing that, many of us have you know, searched our own history, our own text, and we see, uh, we see support for that idea. Um, so I see great support for that idea, not only in the sound of teachings, but also in practice over the centuries where um, there, were, uh, there were, were always reserves for, uh, for wildlife that were considered their right, that they had a right to certain space. But the question is, why haven't we been, been paying attention to those for a long time? Um, and, it's, and it shows us why we need to really be open and listen to what other people are saying, because if indigenous people of South America hadn't really brought this to our consciousness, we might have continued to be negligent of this very important ethical obligation that we have. And so they've done us a favor by making us aware so that we can be more compliant with our own obligations, in fact. The uh, Montgomery bus driver. Thought, I was thought to be the beginnings of uh, some changes in the civil rights laws in this country. Uh, the divestment of the debt of U.S. and European companies in South Africa might have played a part in the apartheid location of the war or the struggle. Um, Presbyterian Church was announced yesterday the day before about the message. What do you think of this as a way of trying to influence? Power, power against non-power. Well, if, if there's 
one thing that um, that capitalism is about, it's about our, our, our right to spend our money where we like. Right? And um, certainly we have an obligation, I believe I have an obligation to acquire wealth lawfully. And that if the wealth, you know, not to, I can't, I can no more uh, put my money in a casino or a bar or a liquor store as a Muslim, then I should feel that I could put my money in a, in a system where there is, um, where the, ba the foundation of it is unlawful. Uh, from what I understand of the Presbyterian move, it's not divestment from Israel, but from uh, operations in the West Bank on, on unlawful land. Uh, it makes sense to me in, in, that, in that context. Um, it accords with what I believe about unlawful land and that people should restrain, uh, should refrain from um, benefiting from unlawfully acquired land. I'm not an expert in what's happening there, so, you know, I, I can't give really more analysis of that specific situation um, than that. But it, there, you know, there's something, there's another uh, discussion that's being happened in, right here in America, which is about, um, which I think has, shares similar ethical principles, and that is the issue of reparations for uh, slavery and for the, um, uh, for the uh, seizing of land and property of African Americans during the Jim Crow era. So there was this month's issue of The Atlantic has an article, a cover story by um, Ta Nahasi, um, this is what I say. Yeah. And it's the cover story of The Atlantic where he explains this uh, why reparations are required. There are places in the United States, um, universities, country clubs, homes, that are on land that was either built by slaves or after emancipation was seized from free African Americans by um, unlawful means. So the question is, um, uh, you know, what's the ethical response to that? I think about, about this idea and um, to me from the Islamic perspective, when I see that the Quran says again and again that if you violate your oath or you sin against someone, um, not only do you need to restore their, their right, but you need, to, um, you need to pay expiation. You need the extra. So that kind of restoration I think is critical. And you know, I really do think that we need to make sure that we are, not that they're mutually exclusive, but that we really take care of our, um, at our obligations, our moral obligations, with respect to the land where we live as well. That's why I'm particularly passionate as a Canadian about what's happening now with um, the restoration of land and treaty rights of First Nations. some of the consumption that we've been um, induced to engage in is um, part of thinking that economics needs to be in a growth model when there's a limit to the Earth's resources. We actually are overshooting the Earth's resources already. Um, this seems unsustainable, and, but it, it seems so ingrained. Um, it's so difficult to think of a system that's not based on growth. Is, is that part of your ethic, or I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I'm not an expert in economics, but it has a lot to do with the way that, um, um, that the law of corporations is structured, so that corporations, public companies, have a legal obligation their stockholders to demonstrate growth and to seek that. So there is a there is a fundamental problem in the law that continues to create that. To the extent of such absurdities as I saw an article recently 
saying that um, that the the lack of U.S. military engagement currently is hurting the economy because um, there's not as much because the military sector is so important um, and without that without without an active war I mean I don't know what kind of wars we have now but a big let's say a big let's say you know a big blockbuster war um, that uh, there's not enough of a demand for all this military equipment and that that is impacting the growth of the U.S. economy. So the, to, even be, to even think that it's reasonable to make a statement like that um, is just shows the absurdity of the growth model. That we could even contemplate that this is a bad, that peace is a bad thing because it's bad for growth. Wow. So definitely the issue of um, the law of corporations, uh, uh, what obligations are to stockholders, all of these things are part are a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Ingrid, thank you very much. To speak up so that and I remember seeing you and your beer a lot. Um, I really thank you for bringing up this detailed uh, discussion. Um, we're very fortunate to live in a cosmopolitan, multicultural, whatever you want to call it, society in the United States, and, and uh, I'm aware that that's not true everywhere. And for me, as a Unitarian Universalist, the biggest benefit that I got tonight was finding that we're not all alone, we're all alone because so often I feel that we are a committee on racial justice and social justice for equal food, and you know, uh, I mean, we're on all these committees and working on all these issues. It is complicated, and as an individual, too, I think this idea about divesting ourselves of these things that we like to invest our money in to make money for retirement or be retired as I am, you know, it's, it's very difficult. A lot of the socially just mutual funds have kind of petered out and aren't there. So um, along with what you said, and along with what you have said, great discussion.